Michelle O'Connell was raised by a single mother in an apartment in St. Augustine, Florida. She had five older siblings. On the night of September 2, 2010, Michelle settled in with her boyfriend, Jeremy Banks, her brother, Sean, and another one of her brothers for the Paramore concert here at the St. Augustine Amphitheater. Obviously, this was a very close-knit family. She had also spent time eating lunch with her sister, Christine, who went by Chrissy earlier that day. Now, at the time, she told Chrissy that she had plans to break up with Jeremy. Her sister said to her, well, you might not want to go to that concert tonight because he's going to be really angry if you're planning to tell him that today. And she said, well, I've got the tickets. I'm going to go have a great time. According to her brother, Sean, everyone was having a great time at the concert with one rather large exception being Jeremy Banks. Sean said that Jeremy seemed very angry throughout the concert and about an hour into the concert, he asked to swap seats with him so he could enjoy the concert with his sister. Unfortunately, it would be the last evening that anyone in this close-knit family would get to hang out with Michelle ever again. That's because later that evening at Jeremy and Michelle's house, two gunshots went off. At the age of only 24 years old, Michelle was found dead in the bedroom. Had she killed herself? That's what Jeremy Banks says happened. Or was it murder? We're gonna look into the case more. This is Twisted Crimes. Be sure to hang around until the end of the video where we will share our opinions on what we think happened. By the time Michelle turned 20 years old, she had a daughter of her own. She named her daughter Alexis. Family members would later say Alexis was the most important person in her life. She wanted to be a great mother for her daughter, and part of that was making sure she provided for her. So for a while, she was working two jobs in order to be able to do that. Her brother Scott was a St. John's County Sheriff's deputy. Through him, she met Deputy Jeremy Banks, who also worked for the St. John's County Sheriff's Department. They had been dating for a little more than a year at the time of her death. In the weeks leading up to her death, she found her dream job at a daycare center. It was an important job. She was given her own key for the daycare center so she could come and go even when the center was closed. Also, the pay was much better than what she was being paid at either of her current jobs. Because of this, she would be able to work just one job and still be able to properly provide for Alexis. She also was going to get health insurance for herself and Alexis through her new job, which was apparently something she had never had as an adult before. According to her new boss, Teresa Woodward, when she told her this, Michelle said, hey, I might go to the doctor soon, not because I need to go, but because I actually have health insurance. Her sister Chrissy was watching four-year-old Alexis during the concert. She said Michelle started sending her strange text messages while she was still at the concert. Michelle, promise me one thing. Lexi will be happy and always have a good life. Chrissy, promise you what? Michelle, that no matter what, Lexi will always be safe and loved. She also sent a text to her brother Scott saying, Lexi, never forget. After the concert, she sent Chrissy one final message. I'll be there soon. According to Jeremy, he enjoyed the concert, but in an interview with Detective Jessica Hines in a police car outside his house after Michelle was found dead, he did admit they had been arguing quite a bit lately. He claimed they made a mutual decision to end the relationship. He would later change that story. His off-duty sergeant was also sitting in the police car for the interview. All right, this is Detective Hines. It is officially September 3rd at 1.23 in the morning. Um, Jeremy, I'm here with Jeremy Banks. Jeremy, tell me about tonight. Where, uh, tell me where, where, where you were at. What where, where, where do you guys have going on? We uh, were at the amphitheater okay. for the concert that went on. And but we argued a little bit there. We you know argued a little bit earlier today, but nothing terrible. Just we were both fed up with each other's bullcrap that we've been 
going, we've been dealing with, you know, we've been together a year and some odd months, I guess a month now, but, um, you know, we were at the show, we were, in, I enjoyed the show, she enjoyed the show from what I understand, and in the car, talking about it, we, we had decided that we were going to break up, she was going to move out. But, according to Jeremy, the fighting had ended by the time they got home. Uh, you know, we, we came home and we weren't arguing when we got home. We got home and we, we talked about it. We just said, you know, enough's enough. We've been fighting. We're done. You know, and I, I told her that I, I do love her, that I, I love Alexis, her little girl. But mm -hmm. I just don't feel like she's, like we're best friends anymore. It's just, it's not working out. And she agreed. And, Right. And uh, yeah, we were talking about it, and we 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 I raised my voice, she raised her voice. We argued, but when we got to the house. We were fine. We started talking, and then kind of just played out from there. Okay. What was it? What'd you get to drink tonight? I was drinking beer. What Bud Light. Beer? Bud Light. Oh. Big okay. ones. <laughs> I don't know why. How many do you think you had? Four, five, maybe. Okay. And then if I did the math, I had a hundred dollars in cash. They were seven dollars a piece. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I said about four or five. And she drank beer also. Yeah, she had about two, three, maybe four. Is I don't that know. is that unusual? No. Okay. No, she has about normal. Okay. Did she seem to be? I mean, we all know at that point that we're, you know, starting to get that feeling of being buzzed and and mm -hmm. do. You, getting drunk kind of thing did she seem to be impaired at all no like I said I had a little bit so I, I was definitely on the ver I was definitely not able to drive mm -hmm. but she she seemed all right you know she didn't seem any different than what she normally is okay. I mean she I guess you could say buzzed but I was pretty impaired myself now this seems strange to me you've got a situation where there are two people drinking at a concert at least one of them, being Jeremy, is drunk, based on his own admission. According to what Chrissy says Michelle told her at lunch, she was going to break up with him after the concert. So let's say Michelle brings this up to Jeremy on the ride home, then he claims they mutually decide to break up, then they're totally fine when they get home. He even told her he didn't feel like they were best friends anymore and it's not working out, then he says she agreed. Clearly he's saying it was basically his idea to break up. I agree with you. The drive from the amphitheater here to Jeremy's house, where we are now, is only about 20 minutes. So we're not talking about a very long time for all of this to play out. Also, they had been drinking. And we all know when you're dealing with a drunk, it's very hard to get them to calm down. And normally, the only way for that to happen is when they finally pass out for the night. Jeremy said after the concert when they got back to his house, which is also where Michelle had been living for several months, he stayed outside talking to two friends for about 10 to 20 minutes. During that time, he only saw Michelle once when she came outside to grab her makeup bag from the car. He said she had told him she was going to pack up all of her things and move out, which again seems very odd. It's late at night and she's going to pack up her things and move out? She hasn't even gone to pick up her daughter yet. And she hasn't contacted anyone telling them what her plans are. After his friends left, Jeremy said he stayed outside sitting on his motorcycle in the garage when suddenly he heard a pop from inside the house. He ran inside. The door to the bedroom was locked. He heard another pop. He said he knew right away. It was the sound of gunshots he had heard. Then he kicked in the locked door to the bedroom and saw Michelle on the floor. Oh, 911. Hey, uh, uh, please get something to my house. It's 4700 truck, please. What's please, going on? Please, send my girlfriend. I think she just shot herself in blood of here, please. She what? She shot herself. Please, okay. Okay. please, please get somebody in. Please. Ma'am, ma'am, I need you to it's calm down. Sir, it's sir. Ma'am, listen to sir. me. It's sir, listen, hang on. Okay, let me tell you the truth. I'm Deputy Banks with the St. Dallas County Sheriff's Office. I'm, I work with y'all. Get someone here now. There are some strange things we're going to go over later in the video about that 911 call, but for now we're going to continue with the events of that night. Police arrived here shortly after the 911 call. 
and one of the first officers to show up that night was Deborah Maynard. She would later say on the PBS documentary series Frontline, the front door of the house was open when she arrived. So she and other officers walked into the kitchen. Then as they made their way to the bedroom, she saw feet on the floor. When they entered the room, they found Michelle on the floor with blood dripping from her face. Jeremy, who police said was obviously drunk, was leaning over by the bathroom door. His gun was laying on the floor next to Michelle's left hand. But Michelle was actually right-handed. There was a tactical searchlight attached to the gun. It was turned on. Jeremy's utility belt was also on the floor by the gun. In addition, the gun had been removed from its retention holster, which is very difficult for a regular citizen to do if they have not been trained to remove the gun from the holster. And something else they found was a bullet near her body. Also, she had a cut above her right eye. The bullet was found to the right side of her, lodged into the floor. So two shots were fired that night, the one in the floor and the one that hit Michelle. They also found a bunch of pills in her pocket. It was a total of 50 pills, including 25 hydrocodone pills, which are a type of painkiller. Then when they searched her purse in the kitchen, they found two empty prescription pill bottles, which were in Jeremy's name. When they counted the pills in her pocket, they discovered there weren't any missing. She was declared dead at 11.48 p.m. that evening. Detectives were able to figure out Jeremy did not check her pulse or attempt any sort of CPR or other potentially life-saving actions when he found her. His attorney, Mac McLeod, would later say, I don't think his frame of mind was as a deputy at the time. I think his frame of mind was completely shocked and freaked out. Not sure what that has to do with him not checking for a pulse or seeing if she's breathing. You know, is she still alive? You wouldn't need to have the mind frame of a deputy to check to see if your girlfriend is still alive. When police searched Michelle's car, they found an appointment book which had a CPR training class written in it for two days after her death. And they figured out she was supposed to meet her friend Mindy Fox on the night she died. According to an article in Tampa Bay Times, Deputy Maynard walked Jeremy out of the house. He admitted he had been drinking. She said when they got outside, all of a sudden, he started growling like an animal. Then he took his fist and hit a police car, which actually left dents in the car. Deputy Wesley Grizzard saw all this going on, so he walked up to Jeremy and said, I told him, I don't care if you're intoxicated or not, you better sober up. Lots of his family, friends, and even off-duty officers began showing up at the scene, hugging Jeremy and offering him moral support. His stepfather, who was also an officer in another county, showed up and talked to him. This all happened before the interview began in the patrol car. Despite this being a strange scene, and despite the fact investigators are taught to treat every death initially as a homicide, it appears that did not happen in this case. Deputy Deborah Maynard would later say, immediately, it was almost like they were taking Jeremy's word that she shot herself at that point. We were told it was a suicide. They automatically said it was a suicide, though we are trained to say every scene is a homicide until proven otherwise. But they did immediately start calling it a suicide. Even the detective who conducted the interview with Jeremy at the scene seemed convinced, before she even interviewed Jeremy, that it was a suicide. Detective Jessica Hines said, I didn't have any suspicions that it was anything other than suicide. I think that's what we were all kind of discussing, but just making sure that we covered our basis. Did she seem despondent to you when you were sitting, when you walked? You guys were arguing, obviously, and you walked outside. I mean, did she say anything? She, you know, I went inside about maybe two, two, three times just to check on her while she was in the house gathering some of her belongings. And then I asked her, I said, you know, is there anything I can do to help? Anything you need? Mm -hmm. And she said, no, Jeremy, I just, I just need my space. And I said, okay. And then we started talking a little bit. I, I asked her, we have a, I, we bought a dog sometime last year. And I asked her, I said, who's going to get the chuck? And she said, you keep him. I've got Alexis. Mm -hmm. And, and that'll be fine. And I said, okay. And the last thing I, I said to her, I, I told her I loved her. I said, please don't do anything stupid. I do love you. You know, I just... 
What, what do you think? What were you thinking? Don't do anything stupid. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, just typical breakup stuff. People say things like, I'm going to kill myself or things like that. She she hadn't said anything like that tonight, So, I, but I just said it. I just said, please, don't yeah. do anything stupid. And she said, Jeremy, I have a Lexus. Okay. And, and I said, okay. And I was like, do you want your space? And she said, yes. And I said, okay. And that's when I walked outside and I told my friends they could go ahead and leave. And that's when I sat on my motorcycle. The don't do anything stupid comment seems weird to me. Exactly. He says, look, she didn't say anything about killing herself. She wasn't acting like she was going to kill herself or anything like that. But he says to her, don't do anything stupid. Then he walks back outside. He leaves his duty belt with the gun in the holster just sitting there. He does not secure it like a police officer is supposed to. Even his own attorney, Mac McLeod, told ABC's 2020, I think that the policy was to secure your firearm, which primarily for law enforcement officers means you put it in either a gun lock or in a secure place up higher so that children and things and other people in the house can't get to it. However, in practice, like other law enforcement officers, he came in, would take his gun belt off, and would place it on a chair or place it somewhere else. Now, it makes sense that some police officers don't follow that rule to a T, especially if there aren't any kids in the house at the time. But the real issue I have here is he tells her don't do anything stupid. So what does he mean by that? If he means he's worried about her committing suicide, then wouldn't it make a ton of sense to take that gun away and lock it up? or take it out to the garage with him if he's going to go sit out there on his motorcycle? Also, it appears based on his own admission that he typically would leave his utility belt with the gun in the holster just laying around the room even when Alexis was home. This is from his second interview 12 days later with Detective Hines at the police station. I know we talked about that night. Um at the end of a shift when you come in and you're taking the duty belt off and uniform and all that, where does all that stuff go? Normally, be there. Right by the nightstand or right there in the corner of the room by my gun locker that I have. It just depends on where I'm at when I take it off, but those are the two primary spots. Just kind of like on the floor or yeah, on just a take furniture? take my gun belt off, I throw it over on the floor. Um, has she ever talked about that, or has that has never been an issue or anything before? She was always worried for Alexis. Sometimes she just she always worried about Alexis playing around with the holster or whatever, possibly getting the gun out. But you know, we just never let Alexis in the room. We weren't in there. It was, it was how it was. Okay. Just a few hours after Michelle died, officers allowed Jeremy to leave. He said he was headed to his parents' house. During those hours after Michelle's death, before they allowed Jeremy to leave, police had not taken him to a structured environment where he could be isolated, interviewed, and photographed. Also, although they did take the clothing, gun, and other evidence, they did not bother to test it for DNA, fingerprints, or gunshot residue. If all that wasn't bad enough, they also did not get his cell phone data or take one of the shirts he was wearing that night. Later, when private investigator Clue Wright was able to get crime scene photographs, he noticed that there was this blue shirt. You can see it right here in the picture. It appears to have blood on it and maybe even a bullet hole. We have no idea what happened to that blue shirt. They also did not canvass the neighborhood to interview neighbors to see if anyone saw or heard anything. Another officer who was there that night, Sergeant Scott Beaver, said, When I first walked into that room, the first thought that went through my mind was, This is not good for Jeremy. I was in the homicide unit for a few years, and it didn't add up. But I didn't do more investigation into this. Then just a few hours after Michelle died, officers began calling Michelle's family, telling them that she had committed suicide. Her mother, Patty O'Connell, later talked to 2020, saying, quote, They just said that she committed suicide. Your daughter killed herself. She committed suicide. That's not Michelle because Michelle loved Alexis, and she never would have left her. She would never. It's not right. And she should still be here today. End quote. 
The sheriff of St. John's County at the time was a man by the name of David Shore. He defended his deputy right from the start of the investigation and always said it was a suicide. The family pushed back and demanded an outside agency look into the case. And finally, four months later, he did pass it over to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Investigator Rusty Rogers began looking into the death. One of the things he did that officers had not done on the night of the death was he canvassed the neighborhood. Which I mean, come on, how could you not canvass a neighborhood in a situation like this? Exactly, it's just common sense. We know that, and we're not investigators. As Rogers was talking to neighbors, he actually found two women who claimed to have heard a woman scream for help two times the night of Michelle's death. Then they heard two gunshots. Those two women passed Secret Service lie detector test and signed sworn statements. Sheriff Shore then attempted to say the women were unreliable witnesses because they both enjoyed smoking marijuana and didn't remember whether they were smoking weed that night. But these women deny this. One of them told Frontline, quote, totally false, completely. Nothing was ever said to us about any kind of drugs or alcohol, end quote. And remember, they both passed polygraph tests and signed sworn statements. Rogers also submitted everything for DNA and fingerprint testing. He got some shocking news when DNA results came back from the gun and duty belt. It turned out there were not any of Jeremy's fingerprints or any of his DNA on either the gun or the duty belt, despite the fact he had warned them to work that day. There was also no trace of blood on the gun even though blood was found on Michelle's arm, legs, and hands. Her DNA was found on the gun, but the two pill bottles that were found in her purse did not have any of her DNA on them. There was also a little bit of her blood found on the inside of Jeremy's t-shirt. Now this is interesting because how do you open the pill bottles and place the pills in your pocket without leaving your DNA on the bottles? The New York Times reported Rogers got a crime scene reconstructionist with the FDLE to take a look at the case. The conclusion was, for the shells to end up where they had, whoever pulled the trigger had to have been left-handed. Which as we know, Michelle was not left-handed, but the report said Jeremy is left-handed. According to ABC News, Rogers also got the University of Florida Child Protection Team to interview Alexis, who was five at the time. During the interview, Alexis said Jeremy was, quote, a bad person and that he fights with her mom. She also watched Jeremy hit her mom with a belt one time. Alexis also said, she said, my mommy would say, stop, stop, but he wouldn't stop. Rogers was also able to interview Jeremy as well. It was the first interview about the death Jeremy had done with anyone outside his own department. During the interview, Jeremy did admit to getting physical with Michelle at one point in the relationship, although he said she had started it and basically he was defending himself. Rogers also had a field test conducted to see if Michelle shot herself or if someone else shot her. His opinion based on the results of the test was that this was a homicide. Rogers gave his report to the medical examiner, a man by the name of Dr. Frederick Hoban, who had initially ruled the death a suicide. He later told reporter Ann Schindler that he changed his mind and that he thought the death was probably a homicide. During that interview, he also said, and I said that, based on this, I would amend the autopsy and change the manner of death from suicide to homicide. I did that, but just internally. I mean, I didn't, I didn't send it out. It wasn't filed with anybody, wasn't sent to the funeral director, wasn't disclosed, anybody except the state attorney. He added that the reason he didn't file the amended death certificate was because the state attorney had told him to hold off since the investigation was still ongoing. Instead of filing the amended certificate, he took it home and kept it at his house along with other documents. He was later reprimanded for this by the state medical examiner's office. Despite the findings, Sheriff Shore refused to change the cause of Michelle's death from suicide to homicide. He even wrote a 152-page report about the case. He devoted two pages to talking about the mistakes his department made in the case. Then he used the remaining 150 pages to defend his department and attack Rogers' investigation, including the field test Rogers had done, saying it should have been done inside to account for the furniture, 
walls, ceiling, and other things in the house. Which is a valid point, but the question is why didn't his office run any sort of tests at all? It also kind of makes you wonder, what exactly was the point of handing the case off to another agency if you're going to stick with what you thought to begin with anyway? In March of 2012, a special prosecutor gathered the O'Connell family together to explain they would be keeping the cause of death as suicide. Michelle's brother Scott exploded in anger at the meeting, and he was fired. In April of 2013, he was hired back when he told Sheriff Shore he would get on board with the suicide ruling. Later, on July 6, 2017, he was arrested for allegedly hitting his wife with a closed fist during an argument. He resigned a few weeks later, and the charges against him were dropped. A few years later, after Michelle died, her family had her body exhumed so another pathologist could perform a different autopsy to determine the cause of death. This was done by Dr. William Anderson. He was out of Orlando. He said that he found that there was a broken lower jawbone that had never been mentioned in the previous report. He said, quote, to People Magazine, the most reasonable explanation is that a hit in the jaw with a fist created the mandible fracture. So the question then became, had he been violent with her in the past? One thing we've always found out about these situations where there's an abusive relationship, that there's other abuse that's gone on with previous girlfriends, or there's been abuse previously with the current girlfriend. In this situation, the Clint family says that yes, there was some abuse, but they were thinking that she was afraid to tell the police because she's in a bad situation here. He's a police officer, her boyfriend, and therefore he's friends, or at the very least colleagues, with the people she's got to turn him into to investigate any kind of abuse. Here's her grave right here in front of us, Michelle O'Connell, October 6, 1985, September 2nd, 2010. Now, Patty says, I saw him be rough with her in my house. He acted like he was fooling around and he took her down, like the way police take a person down. And it was a hardcore slam on the floor. And then when she complained, he immediately said, Michelle, I'm not hurting you. My gut feeling was that he was hurting her, end quote. Kristen O'Connell says he put his knee up on her stomach and pressed really hard and slammed her. And she called me, she said, Chrissy, I'm bleeding. And I told her I was going to call an ambulance and she said, please, you're going to make it hard on me. Please, I don't want any trouble. She was so scared to go for help. I think she may have been influenced by the fact that he would lose his job and retaliate against her, end quote. After that second autopsy on May 23rd, 2016, Sheriff Shore released another written statement, this time writing, the information presented today is nothing new and all was reviewed during the initial autopsy. Molesting Michelle from her place of rest using some freelance type approach is beyond unconventional. It was reprehensible. As for the allegations of abuse, Jeremy, in both his initial interview in the police car and then again in the follow-up interview 12 days later, told a completely different story. Uh, let me ask you this, in the past, has this ever been something that she said she would do? Have there been threats? About a month ago, we were fighting, and it, you know, it was at the point where I, I told her I was sick of her stuff and go. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were fighting, and she, she tried to come at me, and she tried to hit me, and I grabbed a hold of her, and I said, what are you doing? You know what I'm doing. You know who I am. You know what I, what I do. You're putting me in a bad spot. I said, just, just go. And she went, she grabbed her daughter, Alexis was staying with us at the time, or it was at the house, and uh, she put Alexis back in bed, and we started talking in the living room, or in the kitchen, excuse me, and you know, she tried to hit me again, because she was just so angry, mm -hmm. and uh, whenever she did that, she said, she said, I mean, not verbatim, I can't tell you exactly what she said, but the words were, sometimes I just, you just make me want to kill myself. Okay. And I, and I, Whenever she said that, I said, are you, are you kidding me? I mean, my reaction was just in shock. Like, I can't believe you just said that. You know, right. you know what I am, who I am, you know what I do. And it, 
you know, we talked about it. Things were calmed down. I mean, that was the extent of it, truthfully. We, then we talked about it. We calmed down, and we were, you know, we worked it out. Okay. Did it seem like a depression issue at all? Uh, in hindsight, it's twenty twenty. Uh, yeah. Maybe. I mean, I don't. I don't know. It's just because she would be one one way one minute, and then she'd get over it, and she'd be fine. So I never thought anything of it. Um, did she ever make any threats of suicide to you? Did she ever say anything? About um, a couple months ago, maybe a month, a month and a half or so, we got into a big fight. And... We got into a fight about... I don't even remember what it was about. Actually, I do remember what it was about. We went... We were at the house, and her brother and brother's girlfriend wanted to come by and hang out. And I said, sure. And Michelle didn't want them to come over because she doesn't like Scott's girlfriend. And uh, the fight was about... It was about me and Scott's girlfriend, per se. And what, what I mean by that is Michelle always thought there was something going on because I met Beth the same time I met Michelle. And, uh, and she was always wondering why I was sticking up for her. And it wasn't that I was sticking up for her because I liked her. I was sticking up for her because Scott was dating her. And she didn't give her a fair shake. And my point behind that was, was she didn't like how Justin, her oldest brother, was treating me. And he hated me for no reason. He still hates me, especially more so now. Understandable. But he hated me. He came at me with a hammer on Thanksgiving. And she hated him for that. And I kept saying, you're doing the same thing Justin was doing. And that was what the fight was about. And, you know, the words got heated and I told her to pack and get out of my house. And she was in the process of doing it. And she came at me. She tried to hit me and I put her on the ground. And I, when she calmed down, she got up and she grabbed Lexi. And, started arguing with me more and I told her to put Alexis back, Alexis back in the bed because she didn't need to hear this crap and then she tried to hit me one more time after she put Alexis in the bed and uh, she said, Jeremy, I just, I don't remember exactly what she said, but I remember she said, sometimes you make me want to kill myself. Of course, we all saw clearly in the Gabby Petito murder that the abuser will often try to turn things around and act like they were the one being abused. That is certainly a possibility here especially since no one has come forward publicly at least and said, hey, Michelle was abusive to Jeremy. The only people who have come forward have been several family members of Michelle who say it was Jeremy who was the abuser. Also in that second interview with Detective Hines, Jeremy admitted he had read the police report about the investigation. So I ran to the living room, I grabbed the phone, and I ran back to the bedroom, I kicked the door in, and there she was. You know, I never saw where... She actually shot herself. I didn't see any wounds. I didn't see an exit wound. I didn't see anything. I just saw her lips were already blue and there was a lot of blood. And I got, I've already read the report. I know I probably shouldn't have. But I just wanted to know what, what was done on the other side. You know, that's only minimal. It's only the basics. Also in that second interview, Jeremy told a different story about the breakup. Remember, initially he said something like, I told her we're not best friends anymore, and she agreed. And when we were walking back to the car after the show, she hands me her camera and asked me to hold on to it. And I said, okay. So I hold on to it, we walk to the car, I throw it up in the dash. And, uh, And I decided I wasn't going to drive because I had a lot to drink, and she said she was perfectly fine, and of course, I'm, I was like, okay, well, if you want to drive, go ahead. And on the way home, she was making a whole bunch of statements for them. She asked me where the camera was, and I said, it's on the dash. And she said, okay, don't lose it. Make sure Lexi gets it. I said, okay. And how old is Lexi? She just turned four. And she said, make sure Alexis gets the camera. I said, okay. And she said, I'll have my shit out this weekend. I said, are we breaking up? And she said, yep. And she said, I'll have my mom come by this weekend and get my stuff. And I said, why your mom? And she said, because I'll be away. And I didn't think anything of it because every time 
One of the things she told me when we first got together was she was already planning to move to Virginia, which is where her oldest brother lives. And she always said that the reason she stayed is because she met me and that if we ever if things didn't work out, she'd go back to Virginia. So that's what I thought she was talking about. She'll just be in Virginia. We need to mention that another medical examiner, a man by the name of Dr. Pedrag Bullock, also took a look at the case. He had an interesting explanation about the cut above Michelle's eye. He felt it was a suicide and said, The only sound, solid forensic explanation is that the gun was upside down and the tactical light caused that. In the Frontline documentary, they actually brought in forensic scientists to take a look at this theory. Forensic scientist Peter Day Forrest said, The idea of it recoiling forward is absurd. Forensic scientist Peter Dioxuk said, In my use of firearms, it defies the laws of physics to have the gun go forward after it shot. I did, in fact, fire the gun and document it using high-speed photography. It simply confirmed the only movement post-discharge is rearwards, not forwards. I'm not saying that the tactical light could not have made that injury. I'm saying that it did not make that injury at the same time that the fatal shot was fired. Adding, if it made the injury in advance, that could have been some sort of an aggression taking place against the victim. Back in 2010, this was a bar called Ring of Fire. Danny Harmon was the owner at the time. He said the very night after Michelle died, her boyfriend showed up here at the bar, Jeremy Banks. He said that Jeremy was making suggestive remarks about her. He said, quote, he told me, that all she ever did was put him down and make him feel bad about himself. He was going to be moving on with his life and he wasn't going to let the blank hold him back anymore. He said in a sworn affidavit that he was sure Jeremy had something to do with her death. Attorney Mac McLeod says his client did not speak to Harmon that night saying, quote, my client wasn't anywhere near that place the night after Michelle took her life. Anytime there's a factual investigation, the facts demonstrate this was a self-inflicted gunshot wound. In January 2019, Eli Washtock was doing his own personal investigation, looking into the death of Michelle O'Connell. At the time, he was living inside this gated community called World Golf Village, inside a condominium complex called La Terra. Now, he was also close friends with Michelle's mother, Patty, Patty described him as another son to her. He had gone to the sheriff's department and made open records request to get all the information for Michelle's case. And he was doing this investigation. Patty felt that he was close to coming to some answers. She said, Washtuck was tracking, quote, on every move Michelle O'Connell's killer made. She said Washtuck told her the suspect, who was in a sheriff's patrol car, once ran Eli and son off the road. Now he had a neighbor here inside the World Golf Village at the condominium who would later say that Eli had actually rented out the apartment or the condo below his because he was so nervous that someone was after him and he was having his kid stay in that apartment to keep the two of them separate. Then, on January 31st, 2019, someone walked into his apartment and began firing. They found bullet holes throughout the apartment. His son showed up that morning and placed a call to 911. Well, what's the location of your emergency? Uh, 945 Registry Boulevard. Do you need law enforcement or fire rescue? Uh, um, well, I think I just need an ambulance. Okay, hold on just a second. I'm going to get law enforcement, I mean, fire rescue on the line and give them your address for a moment. Just stay with me for a second. All right, fire rescue. He's at 945 Registry Boulevard? Yeah, 305. I'm going to tell you what's going on there. Um, got shot. Just got shot? Yes. Okay, what makes you think that? 
He is currently laying on the floor with blood around his head. Okay, is he breathing, sir? It does not appear to be so. Okay. And is there any way you can look at his chest and see if, if it's going up and down? Um, I don't believe it is. Washtak is buried in the same cemetery as Michelle. His grave is actually just a short distance off to the right of her grave. He was 38 years old when he died, and he left behind a 15-year-old son. Police have not named any suspects in his death. They have ruled it a homicide. Now let's go back to that 911 call. We're going to share our own opinions of the call as well as enlist the help of the folks at Statement Analysis. We'll link their website below. 911. Hey! Uh, Please get something to my house. It's 4700 truck, please. What's please, going on? Please, send my girlfriend. I think she just shot herself in blood of here, please. She what? She shot herself. Please. Okay, okay. Did please get someone here. Please. Ma'am, ma'am, I need it's you to calm down. Sir, it's Sir, Ma'am, it's listen to sir, me. It's sir, listen, hang on. Okay, let me tell you the truth. I'm Deputy Banks with the State Dallas County Sheriff's Office. I'm, I work with y'all. Get someone here now. The first thing I clearly notice is how his voice drops and suddenly he's trying to put himself in charge. Yeah, he starts out screaming and hysterical like, my girlfriend, she shot herself. And he's got this real high pitched voice. And then it's like when she says ma'am to him, his voice drops. He's got to be in control. The concern seems to be gone for Michelle and he's more concerned that he's being called ma'am by the dispatcher. Another thing statement analysis points out is at the beginning, he thinks his girlfriend shot herself rather than he knows she did it. Oh, 911. Hey, uh, uh, please get something to my house. It's 4700 truck, please. What's please. going on? Notice he doesn't ask for help for his girlfriend here at the start of the call. Of course, asking for help should be the entire point of a 911 call, but it's something he does not do here. Sir, listen, hang on. This is when his voice drops and he wants to clarify he is not a woman. And it is sir, she should be calling him. You can also pick up some clues with this part about the respect he feels he deserves from other people. Right, and specifically we're trying to see if this was potentially an abusive relationship. If you figure out he demands to be respected, then you wonder if perhaps he didn't feel he was being respected properly by Michelle at different points in the relationship. Ma'am, ma'am, I need you to calm down. Sir, it's sir. Ma'am, listen to me. It's sir, listen, hang on. Okay, let me tell you the truth. I'm Deputy Banks with the State Dallas County Sheriff's Office. I'm, I work with y'all. Get someone here now. And it's not like he's just saying it once. He's repeating it over and over and over again. It's sir, it's sir, it's sir, it's sir. Then he uses a classic line, let me tell you the truth. Which according to statement analysis, it means the next thing the person is going to say is probably true. But it's going to be followed up by something that isn't true. Again, reading directly from statement analysis, he says, I'm Deputy Banks. Note that he uses title rather than first and last name. He sounds like one who is desperate for respect. This does not bode well for the girlfriend. Note that he now demands that they get someone out there, but fails to ask for help for the victim. He does not beg. He orders. This is part of who he is. Okay, I need you to calm down then. I you know how it goes. What's the address? I don't... 4700 Sherlock Place. Okay, what's Four, going on going there? Two, my girlfriend just shot herself with my C weapon. Please get okay, someone here now. Please. Sir. Now we hear the first big change in what Jeremy is saying. Remember back to the beginning of the call, he thought his girlfriend had shot herself. Now he knows she shot herself. And he adds on to that, that she did so with his duty weapon. Sir, we're doing that while I'm talking to you. Is she still breathing? No, there's blood coming out of everywhere, please. Why does he say that there's blood everywhere when we know that there was only blood coming out of her mouth? Please, okay, so I, she, she's not breathing. Call dispatch on TAC 2. Get them here now. It's obvious he feels a need to always be in control. Once again here, he's trying to take control of the situation. He's telling dispatch what they need to do. I am Sir, the they are on please, the phone. I need you to please, calm please, down. Please, 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 please,
that he may not be telling the truth. What it is that is to be understood is that he needed to persuade Dispatch that she shot herself. Why would he need them to understand this? Would it matter to the bleeding victim who pulled the trigger? It matters very much to the caller." End quote. Now we're going to add our own personal opinion as to what we think really happened. I think that she actually did not commit suicide and that her husband killed her. What was really odd is that there were no fingerprints on his service weapon, which is the same gun that she supposedly killed herself with. That is very strange to me. There's also the fact of the pills. You got all these pills in her pocket, the empty pill bottles, and yet none of that is found in her system. Then you have the second autopsy where they find out that she's got the bottom part here. The jaw is broken right through here, which could very well have been from being punched there. Then there's also a test round is what they're saying. She's testing the gun and she shoots it into the floor before she shoots herself. Then there's the fact that they're trying to say she's holding the gun upside down and it would have somehow popped in this direction and hit her in the eye and caused the mark on her eye. There are just so many things that don't really add up here. And she also broke up with him at the concert that night. Of course, that's huge too. I mean, that gives you a motive right there. It'd be a strange time to break up and decide. I mean, she was planning to break up with him, that's for sure. But it'd be strange to do it that night after a concert after 11 o'clock at night and that's when you're going to move all your stuff and where is she going to go right that moment i don't know that whole part seemed very strange to me as well and then he's trying to say that they were fine oh once we got home everything was fine we fought like cats and dogs on the ride home but once we got home everything's fine i just sat in the garage i hear the gunshots she's in there packing up her stuff getting ready to leave it doesn't really add up to me either tell us what you think in the comment section below and we can talk about it down there Thanks for watching.